It's Waxing Lyrical, baby. Hello, Waxers, and welcome to Waxing Lyrical with Mains and Dots. I'm your host, Mains, and my colleague in the danger zone in Rainford, to Mr. Neil Dutton. How are we, Neil? What are your thoughts on soup? I love a soup one. Soup. My Is wife it... my wife makes probably the greatest tomato soup on the planet, Lou. Would you have it as a meal by itself, or would you have to have it and then have something else? What time of the day is it? Uh, we'll go with lunchtime to mid-afternoon. Lunchtime, it, it's okay to be your dinner with a roll. Right. right. You couldn't At have tea soup. time, no. No. Then it's a starter as part of a three-course meal. Right. I say, you're not, you're not going to thank anyone if it's, okay, for tea, I've got you um, a big soup, steak and potato. No. Why? It is something that, um, you know, friends of the pod, JJ and Denny, were talking about on Living the Stream. And, you know, Denny did say, he also did the immortal words, I'm trying to sum up some feelings about this, but I just can't. Um, I mean, it just strikes... people, I'm not, I, I, you know, if that's if that's people's game plan, that's people's game plan. I'm just suggesting that it's not mine. It's, it's as you say, I think it, it's weird because, you know, you know, this is obviously the content that anyone who's listening is tuned in for. Body, you know, internal body uh, digestion. You're supposed to have your biggest meal at lunchtime. You are. But I'd st- on the flip side of that is I'm still perfectly happy having a bowl of soup at lunchtime. But come at, come come five o'clock, you hand me a bowl of soup, I am asking what's next. Yeah, correct. That's what I'm saying, right? Like, and it's not, you know, it's not, you know, that's just how our brains work. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, if someone gave me soup, I'd be like, cool. And then? Yeah. Let's skip to the end. You know, tomorrow is spaced, isn't it? Yeah, no, exactly. Glad we got that sorted. But anyway, it's a week, week 10 in the NFL. One of the wildest um, schedules in terms of how the, how the games are spread out, given the fact oh. that the Masters has played absolute havoc with CBS. So I, I believe CBS haven't got any early games. And I all their so. games are late games. So I think there's more games at 9 o'clock UK time than there are at 6 o'clock UK time which means get those coffees in gents and ladies because you're going to be staying up Hanson's going to be so happy but when's he going to do them sponsored segments on you know fancy player of the week or stuff do you know what I mean when they're in they're at both both the games are on their break they're not coming till 10 to midnight 10 to 1 <laughs> you know, and, but you know but the, you know the best thing is we get double witching hour. Do you play witching hour? Is 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 correct? Neil is absolutely correct. That's not what we're talking about on the show, though. Although we thought we'd bring it up, um, we're going to look at some teams who who have had a flaw highlighted to us over the course of the first nine weeks, and we want to know if that flaw will stop that team from being successful in January. Um, if January is the time we play the playoffs. Um, we're then also going to take a quick look at the Texans, who are doubling down on their debacleness after the uh, Bill O'Brien era. And then we'll do the standard fancy stuff. A fancy darling, a fancy loser, and our DraftKings team of the week. Mine has my favourite quarterback in it. And that's all I'll say on that. So, Neil, let's start. And let's plug into the mains. So, as I said, there's a few... Teams which I think we're comfortable are going to make the playoffs. However, they've they've had flaws exposed over the past weeks and in one sense since the past twenty five years. And our question is: Can will that flaw stop that team from, I guess, getting to a Super Bowl? Mm-hmm. Um, first team on on the on the docket is the Seattle Seahawks and their defense. Um, best best story of all of last week was Pete Carroll telling me after his team had conceded 40-plus 40, 40 points after Josh Allen had looked like the second coming of the greatest quarterback of all time that he'd planned out really well for them to run the ball a lot when they ran it three times. Yeah. Um, so if we if we get over the fact that you know maybe Pete and Ken Norton Jr. should look at game plans more than a week in the past... Um, does the Seahawks defense stop the Seahawks getting to where they want to get to? Yes. Um, whether it stops them 
<clears throat> sorry, whether it stops them climbing to the top of the NFC, I don't know because we know that Russell Wilson can probably go punch for punch with your Aaron Rodgers, your Tom Brady, your Drew Brees. You know that. The problem is, is that they're going to have to go up. Say they get to the Super Bowl and they play the Chiefs. The Chiefs can make more stops than the Seahawks. Yeah. So unless you know they change the rules to say, tell you what, then every time Seattle get the ball, you can have two possessions. They're not going to be able to keep pace with the Chiefs. The defense is terrible. And as I say, game planning. We game plan to stop the run. The Bills don't run the ball. And, the Bills know, they, run they, the ball in a game where they thought it was the right idea for their offense to run the ball. You know, yeah. Like that's how you're supposed to do offense now. You're not just yeah. supposed to do the same thing over and over again. Maybe plan for the team you're playing. So they're not going to throw it at the Patriots secondary, which is good. Yeah. See, we had an issue with that the other week. It was Kyle Shanahan being too clever. Was it against the, the Seahawks? Or I think it might have been. You know, the um, it was decided the we're just going to run the ball. No, they're, 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 they've got no corners. Throw on them. Um, and yet, they, Pete Carroll just thinking, oh yeah, well, tell you what, let's make them one-dimensional so they have to pass. They were always going to. Because uh, that's when Josh Allen has been good this year. So, yeah, I just think their defence is terrible. And it's probably, you know, the defence has got incrementally worse every year. We did think a couple of years ago that maybe there was a second-generation Legion of Boom coming. Yeah, it was a flash in the pan. That was a mistake on our part, right? Yeah. It, They're always going to be in games because, you know, it's in their DNA. They can't blow teams out. And also, you know, they can't be blown out. But I just think that they're going to come across teams that are going to make just enough stops and Russell will not be able to work his magic every single time. Their defence is going to cripple this team somewhere down the line. I think I think what we should say is, I think the next two weeks, they have the Rams and the Cardinals. That's ungood in the I don't want these teams to pass on me scenarios because those teams will. Um but after that, I think their next four games are Eagles, Jets, Giants and Washington. So is this a fatal flaw that stops them making the playoffs? I don't really think so. No. But I think you're right. And as you said, could they get through the NFC? Yeah, probably. Could do. Am I as confident as I was? Probably not. I mean, you never thought they would get that far anyway, Neil. So you're probably in maybe the same position, just the team looks slightly different. Mm. Um, but as you said... Like the Patrick Mahomes thing is an issue, the Travis Kelsey thing is an issue, the whoever they throw it to who isn't Travis Kelsey is an issue, and if they if they don't fix it somehow, you know that they got major problems. Yeah, you can let you can let Russ call who all you want, but if no one's coming to the restaurant, I like me to do. Let's move on, Neil. AFC AFC North. The Ravens, the floor at the moment is the offense. It's not great. And I think the issue is, if you look at the stats, and I was listening to Warren Sharp earlier today, and if you don't listen to Warren Sharp, you're doing stuff wrong, Mm -hmm. um, that Lamar Jackson's actually passing better this year than he was last year. The problem is they're still trying to run it four billion times. And the other issue is they seem to try and run it with the running backs who aren't as good. Yeah, um, it can be a problem where you know this is the we've been saying this for weeks about the Ravens is that it's almost like they were trying to evolve where they probably didn't need to. They probably just needed to be an execution offense. I.e., you know what we're going to do. We know what we're going to do. We know you know we know what we're going to do. We're still going to do it. Stop it. And you know you get the problem there that you had Mark Ingram taking far too many snaps for, away from. Gus Edwards, who was taking far too many snaps away from J.K. Dobbins. You had Lamar Jackson, who's still running as much. You're not getting the ball into you know your best playmaker's hands. Mark Andrews was supposed to be like the next great, you know, the next white hope at tight end. He's disappeared. He's on milk cartons. He's being outproduced by Nick Boyle. Oh God. Um, Marquise Brown, as you say, someone said, you know, oh. Well, he, he he got the attention he wanted last week. Five targets, seriously? That That's going to make everything better, is it? No, I really don't think so. The worry is, as, and we did touch on this, is that Greg Roman's offences go stale. This appears to be going stale quite quickly. The fact that he has to come out and say, oh, it happens all the time when defences call out your plays. No, it doesn't. I don't want, I don't want my franchise quarterback 
if I'm the offensive coordinator, I don't want the, the uh, my franchise quarterback who now runs the whole the whole franchise to basically say our plays are being called out because everyone knows what they are because that mm. probably means I won't have a job. Yeah, I mean it's all very well you know you know if you, you don't want to be too predictable, but also you don't want to go away from things that work. Now it's it's all very well you know say, say the defense shouts the play yeah that's great but if you're crap and you can't stop it at least you'll know what beat you. The worry for this is that they're calling the plays the defense know what the play is and the play's shite. That's a problem. And you know, as you say, defensively they're as good as anyone in the NFL. In terms of um, the NERD ranking at number five, which you know takes all the plays on a per play basis and adds it all up, they're the best defense. In fact, they're the best overall team in the NFL, especially on defense. But the problem they're having on defense is they're starting to pick up the injuries now. Calais Campbell's going to be missing for a few weeks. Marlon Humphrey missed last week because of COVID. He's probably going to be back. Another player has tested positive. They don't know who it is. Their depth is being tested. And there may come a time where the defense is like, sorry, you're going to have to carry us one uh, for this week. And I don't think the offense at the moment is able to do it the way it was able to do it last year. And again, let's call it what it is. They're two games behind the Steelers. They still have to play the Steelers, which means the best thing I hope for at the moment is the fifth seed in the playoffs. That means you're going on the road to someone. I know being on the road this year isn't the same as in past years, Mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean basically eventually... If you want to get to the Super Bowl, you're going to have to beat the Steelers and Patrick Mahomes. And we've seen that they can't. Yeah, they play the Patriots this week. They then have Titans and Steelers, which is obviously tremendously difficult. They then, however, go Cowboys, Browns, who I'm, I'm pretty sure are a mirage, even though they're 5-3. and three. The 1-7 and seven Jaguars, who at that point, I assume, will be praying that the Jets win every game. Uh, the Giants, who will probably be gutted, they don't play Washington every week, and the Bengals. Um, so, again, is the floor going to stop them making the playoffs? No, I don't think no. it is. Um, but is it going to stop them getting to the Super Bowl? Yeah, because as you said, they're going to have to beat the Steelers at least once, and that would have to be in January, and they're going to have to beat the Chiefs, and they have shown no ability to be able to do that no and it's one of those it, we've seen now in the modern NFL you can have a great defence the 49ers defence last year was epic but special quarterbacks will make enough plays so you can't shut them down you can't shut these players down anymore you can only restrict and offensively it doesn't matter what they restrict because I just don't think they've got the horses to get into a shootout especially if they fall behind in one it, next, it, don't let's stay in the let's stay in the AFC North. Um, the Steelers seem to be hanging their season, much like most seasons, on their quarterback Ben Roethlisberger, who's getting older, and you know, getting less and less fit. Now we all we've made jokes for probably four years on this show about how Big Ben's never fit, but his never fit now seems to stop him playing games when it never used to, and if he isn't playing, then. Mason Rudolph's playing, and he ain't getting it to those wide receivers. No. As Josh Norris, I always struggle on that. As he said last week, everyone in the world, the Steelers need to really address the backup quarterback position. Kevin Colbert, la, 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 la. Wasn't last week the most typical Steelers performance in the Mike Tomlin era you've seen for many a moon? No, because they won. Yeah. So yes, yeah. So like when it was half ten UK time, and they were losing by ten points, I think I was like, yeah, of course, we've all been waiting for this. Oh look, here's Sideshow Bob. Here's a rake. He's going to stand on it. But they won, so I don't know if it was or maybe it was something different. Um, their problem, as you say, Ben Roethlisberger is. Any ball he throws more than like 10 yards downfield is being sent up with hope rather than expectation. They are little floaty, light little lollipops going up in the air where he's either praying a defender falls down or a defender pushes a wide receiver because the wide receivers had to turn back to get the ball because it's been so badly underthrown. I don't think you can win a Super Bowl if DPI is your best pass catcher. 
This is why, argue. This is why I think that Chase Claypool has the most yards on the team, and and um, Juju doesn't, because they're using Claypool in you know a multitude of different ways from the backfield, short passes, whatever. Whereas Juju's more of a standard standard wide receiver, if you know what I mean. And I don't think, as mm. you said, Ben. Ben Roethlisberger ain't throwing a 15 yard out in the same level no. of accuracy as he did five years ago. I mean, Juju has seen, I think his target uh, rate has been fairly consistent the last few games. I think he's got six in each of his last three games, but he's not doing an awful lot with them because they're so, you know, the balls are so floaty light. They're not being thrown into space where you can run with them and rack up the yak. It's literally, catch that, please. Okay, we'll go again. The defense is incredible, as we know, but. I, I don't know how many times we're going to see Roethlisberger come off the field holding his elbow before someone acknowledges maybe it's still a problem. And yeah. he hurt his knees, obviously, last week. He was off for a few plays, came back on, as we know, because you know, it's what Ben Roethlisberger does. You know, John Wayne never let them sh- never let them see him bleed. But, you know, it's a worry because I don't think in this day and age, you can say, we're just going to do enough on offence and beat you with defence. Yeah, you, you can get to the playoffs, but you're not winning it. That's the they're, they're in the San Francisco 49ers last year camp, right? Yeah. Whereas, like, if they get into a shootout with the Kansas City Chiefs, well, they won't, because they'll no. just lose, because they're bringing a knife to a gunfight. Mm. They're not in the same ballpark. So see, it's you know, as the great Therese Paler always says, nowadays the modern quarterback, you've got to look at him and ask, can you pull a play out your ass when we need it? Yeah. And Ben Roethlisberger just can't. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. He, he just can't. Final final one, Neil, um, is the Buffalo Bills. And there's a slightly different um because they've seems they've won a games in a couple of different ways. Their defence isn't as good as last year, but it's done enough. Josh Allen is infinitely better than he was last year. But is there a fatal, fatal flaw the weight of history? Uh, there could be. I say you've got to go back an awful long way for the last time they won a division title. Usual, you know, semi-regular reminder that the Indianapolis Colts have won the AFC East more recently than the Bills. The issue I have is we know that Josh Allen has been very good. And this year they've put an awful lot on his plate and he has delivered and has been very good. The problem I think is... Let's get to a primetime Ireland game where the world is watching. Josh, put down the sherbet. Stop eating the blue smarties. Because we've seen that game before. Yeah. Now, that game against the Seahawks, yeah, it was fantastic. He was brilliant. It was a 1 pm kickoff. No, I'm not saying. I'm, you are, you know, throwing, I'm not, are you throwing Kirk Cousins at his backside here, by the way? I'm throwing, throwing Kirk Cousins. I'm throwing Andy Dalton. I'm just saying it's a narrative, and narratives exist for a reason. You've shown this year that you can be the driver of the offence when it is put on your back. But when it comes down to the big games, I know they're all big games, but you know what I mean? Yeah. The big games. Can you do it? Because he's going to have to, because again, like the Seahawks, this is not a good defence. It should be. And it probably galls the living piss out of Sean McDermott that it isn't. But this is where we are. Exactly. I, I just... Should they win the division from where they are? I think so. Um, will they? I, I hope so. Well, I, I don't. I actually secretly want the Miami Dolphins to do it, but that's a different conversation for another time. Um, you know, is it? Do I? Do you hold back on teams like this? That they're, they're not the they're not the Browns in that kind of situation. I mean that that would be silly. But you know what I mean is are the are you as confident that they're just gonna? go through and sort this stuff out Let, let's look at their schedule for example this week at the at the Cardinals game of the week yeah weirdly then they play the Chargers so they'll win that somehow just by bizarrely just by randomness then they're at the 49ers they play the Steelers the Broncos the Patriots and the Dolphins well that the game there that we you got to be circling it's the Steelers Mm. That's the game. That's the that's you know the and that's the, the, Sunday, and that is Sunday night NBC game that one. Just yeah. in that in that sense. 
just on, on, on another point there, we've been talking about the charges. We've mentioned many, many times in the past how many ways they can find to lose a game. In the spirit of the last few weeks in the American political sphere, I've worked out the only way left for the charges. It's to actually score more points than the opponent and still lose. Okay, yeah, it makes sense. That's the only way they can... I don't know how, that's not that guy, idea guy, but that's the only way that they have left to lose in a bizarre fashion before they actually start winning. Oh, they're not starting winning. Like that's no, no, uh, that's that's ridiculous. That's, that's not Anthony Lynch stick. No, no. Right, let's move on, Neil, and let's talk about the uh, Tennessee Titans. No, Houston Texans, not Tennessee Titans. If Mister Foxcroft is listening and you've just confused the Titans with the Houston Texans, he's going to lose his shit. He's going to lose his shit anyway because he's. T- t- yeah. If he sends me another just eat meme or gif or whatever, so there we go. Um, and he can be complain fair, about Jonah. bringing back the old show as well. Yeah, he hasn't that's Jonah, to be fair. He hasn't, he hasn't actually, done that in half an hour, has he? Uh, so, yeah, well, let, let him do that. Um, Neil, the Houston Texans fired um, the vice president of communications today. A, sorry, yesterday. Um, Amy Pallick. Um, Pallick was the first woman to serve as a top PR contact for a team. She was well respected. Palak won. Uh, t- Palak's team won the 2017 Pete Rosell Award presented annually by the Pro Football Writers of America to the best PR staff. Um, JJ Watt's response: First and only woman to be head of PR for an NFL team and winner of the Rosell Award. Massive help in my hurricane relief efforts. Put in bracket, bracket, brackets. He earned literally millions of pounds. It, uh, they earned millions of dollars to help that relief effort. Whoever picks up Amy Pallack will be getting one of the best in the business. Um, the the owners, uh, President Jamie uh, Roots, insists he made the decision to fire um, today. Definitely my call. I gave I gave her the role a number of years ago and felt the change was needed. This has obviously got nothing to do with the fact that some guy um, is trying to, uh, and that guy being. He- Executive Vice President of Football Operations Jack Easterby is is doing a massive power play to try and get full control of the Houston Texans. Yeah, the fact that absolutely everyone who is anyone in the NFL has come out and said nice things about Amy. You've got Rich Eisen, you've got Doug Farrar, you've got J.J. Watt, you've got other people, you've got Amy Trask, you've got all these people whose opinions you should listen to and respect. They're all coming out and saying this is a bewildering move. If they're saying she no longer fits the culture, the inference I'm getting is you're building a culture that no one wants any piece of. This team was toxic already because of Bill O'Brien. Usually when you fire coaches like that, it's supposed to be like opening the window and letting the air in. This seems like you've thrown him out but taken a shit in the corner of the room and made the air even more repugnant. Honestly, J.J. Watt isn't even hiding it anymore. He wants nothing to do with this club. He's going to go out there and he's going to, probably going to bust his balls on the field, but he does not want anything to do with it. He's sick of being the face of it. He's sick of being the voice of it because everything he was there to build up is being taken away. Deshaun Watson, as I think you know, you're going to mention it is, Deshaun Watson must seriously be looking at his agent and probably looking at his bank balance as well, but must be looking at his agent and saying, what the did we sign for? Well, well if, we, if we go on in that sense, Neil... Um, there's a Sean Watson and Laramie Tunsil who will have long term deals and are young players, yeah. Mm. No one else is safe on that roster. No. And this team is get go and this team has got no real cap space at the moment and no uh, draft capital. No. Therefore they are going to get worse before they get better. So mm-hmm. if you're a team that's gonna get worse before you get better, what you want is good PR. Yeah. Like I know this. Do you know why I know this? Because I support the spot Washington. Because I support the Washington football team, who have been terrible and have had the worst PR ever. They've now hired Julia Donaldson. They've now hired a new exec, and are attempting to do things better. They're still really, really bad on the field, but there is an attempt by the organisation to at least be better at the things that they can control in term off the field. This seems to suggest 
much like it used to be in Washington. They don't really care about all that stuff and care about being in charge of things. Hi, Bruce Allen. How are you? Um, this is not going to help the Houston Texans. And it's going to make them worse before it makes them better. Yeah. We are in serious danger of, in two, three years maybe, people will start asking questions about Deshaun Watson because of how crap the team has been around him. Regardless of what numbers he puts up, it will be... Basically, he'll be looked at like Jay Cutler. Yeah, but he's... Yeah, because but without the, the team... Without the smoke without the smoking, yeah. Because this team is going to be absolute trash. They're going to be constant joke off the field. Because they... they, they I'm not being funny. If this fellow is going to be in charge of hiring a coach, he has shown us absolutely nothing so far to suggest that he should be trusted with such an appointment. There's going to be PR disaster after PR disaster. As you say, the players are going to get worse. So on the field, they're not. Gonna, they can't I don't think they can. I don't think the problem is. I don't think they can control the players getting worse. I think no, that, that's can't. already set in motion that the team will get worse. Yeah. Unless they're tremendously lucky and get a load of excellent players in the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh round, there's no doubt that this team gets worse. But have you, did you see that stat as well? Um, their game against the Texans, uh, the Jaguars. Sorry. The Jaguars have the most snaps played by rookies in the NFL this year. The Texans have the least. So you've not even put in place rookies from this class to build on. No. You've got nothing. This team's going to be a dumpster fire. It's a good thing. I mean, this will be the worst possible thing. The Jets need to do something to play nicely and put Trevor Lawrence's mind at rest. Because otherwise... The Texans are going to be in play for them next year, and regardless of what dickhead they've got running the show, they might think about it. Uh, that was it on the small rant that me and Neil wanted to do on the Houston Texans. There's not much to talk about, really, just to say they're really bad and they ain't getting better anytime soon. Um, let's move over to the fantasy side of the show, Neil, and let's start with your fancy darling. Hello, darling. Will it stun you that my fancy darling plays for the Houston Texans? No, because because they still got Deshaun Watson, right? Like yeah. so, they will they will still score points in certain games. I, you went Jay Cutler. I would go Matthew Stafford. That's Stafford probably still threw, one, yeah. Stafford still threw for a load of yards and yeah. had fantasy relevant wide receivers. The rest of the team is rubbish, though. Yeah. Yeah, I think Stafford's probably a better comparison. However, my fantasy darling this week. Now we we do know you know we we like to look at things like you know matchups and you know injuries and advanced metrics. But the one thing we should always look for is revenge, <laughs> and that's why my fantasy darling this week is Duke Johnson, because the Texans are playing the Browns. These two teams have basically gone out with their way to misuse Duke Johnson. We saw last week when David Johnson went down, Duke Johnson came in and was the workhorse. I've only been telling people this for six years, that he can be the workhorse. He had 16 carries, only 41 yards. He also had four targets and caught them all for 32 yards. He's going to be the workhorse. You know, we've seen that, you know, that means for some bizarre reason, the Texans are going to lean on the run even when it doesn't affect, it doesn't help them. But also we know that Duke Johnson is an excellent pass catcher. So, I just think it's not just the revenge, obviously, although that's a big part of it. Um, I just think that he's in line. He, you know, We've got someone here who potentially is going to see 20 opportunities this week. And in DFS, he's going to be, you know, he's cheap as chips. And, I was, you know, and plus, I've always liked Duke Johnson, and I will always, always champion if I can. Of course, Neil, of course. Um, enough of you championing someone. Let's find out someone who you do not like this week and do fancy loser. Obviously, it was nice for Christian McCaffrey to pop in for a week uh, and, and, and then disappear again. You know, you, you thief in the night, you, Christian. But, you know, there's a lot of people who maybe they picked up Mike Davis and a few people dropped him. Stupid thing to do. Um, but I don't think, while I think Davis has shown in the past that he's been a good substitute for McCaffrey, I don't like him this week against the Bucks. The Bucks have shown that they can stop the run. They're not giving up very many receptions to running backs. 
I just don't think this has the hallmarks of a Mike Davis game. Um, and then it'll be a chance. Sorry, it'll be a case of as people are telling us, there's a good chance McCaffrey will be back again next week, or maybe in two weeks when McCaffrey's injured again, Davis will be in play. But for this week, I'm not really interested. This is awkward. Anyway, let's get on with our daily fancy teams of the week. Mains and dots. Daily fantasy team of the week. Show me the money. As always, usual stuff. DraftKings lineup: quarterback, two running backs, three wide receivers, a tight end, a flex, and a defense and special teams. Neil, who's your quarterback this week? My quarterback, going back to Texas and no doubt feeling dangerous after his COVID layoff, is Baker Mayfield. Six thousand dollars. As I say, the Texans' defense is trash. It let Jake Luton. Um, put on a show against them. I think Mayfield, you know, now that he's you know, he's not terrible, he's shown he's got some pieces around that he's got rapport with. He's got Austin Hooper coming back. Hollywood Higgins is obviously there. Jarvis Landry still hasn't scored a touchdown this year that he has thrown for one. I think this game, as I say, could shoot out a little bit, but I would imagine that the Browns, you know, are going to lean on the ground game. But I like Mayfield to throw some touchdowns. So six thousand, I'll go with Mayfield. Yeah, my quarterback this week is Tua Tonga Bailoa. He is uh, at home facing the LA Chargers and Justin Herbert against Tua. Um, I was into a podcast before, Neil, and I find quite interesting on Herbert and Tua. Um, based on how they played, um, and Washington took Chase Young, and Chase Young's been excellent and is probably going to win Defensive Rookie of the Year. Patrick Queen. Uh, carry on. <laughs> yeah, he's a linebacker. He, he, Thanks, cool story in that. Um, <laughs> um, should they have taken, based on what we know now, the obvious thing is they should have took one of these two, right? Yeah, because Dwayne Haskins is not a good enough reason to not take two at Viola or Justin Herbert. But, but to, we be did, fair, to be fair, no one knew Justin Herbert was going to be good, right? And no, no, one, I, I, no one believed, no one believed that two was fit. No. And, 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 every, and from what you read, a lot of people did not believe that Justin Herbert could play in the NFL. And it no, proved and we, that beyond a doubt. We talked to Mark Schofield, you know, our, our resident QB guru, yeah. you know, in the pre draft process, and he was not sold on it. No. And if Mark's not sold on someone, I'm not. Yeah, I agree. Uh, but I've gone for two of this week. Uh, 5,600 allows you to spend a bit more elsewhere. Um, he's fun. And I this that that game against Arizona was the, the bammer to it that I saw before he got injured and I hope we see a lot more of it because it'll be fun if we do I really really hate quarterbacks wearing one that was a one on one matchup though Neil for the first time ever Tua believe. versus Mike the Martian it was awesome yeah it's it's a punter's number or a I goalie what I hear what you're saying but those two are far from punters I um, know and and as we saw from a, a, a text that our friend friend Charles sent us um Kyler Murray sneakily more yards, more touchdowns than Lamar Jackson last year in his MVP. Year. But more more points, more fancy points to his first nine game, nine weeks of season than any player in NFL history. It's frightening. It, it my understanding, gonna if he can't, continues on his rushing play, pace, he will have over eleven hundred yards and sixteen touchdowns. Yeah. And by the way, he's also going to throw for four thousand yards. Do you yeah, know I mean? that's that's okay. Um, who's your running back one, Neil? Running back one is Aaron Jones. Uh, the Packers are playing the Jacksonville Jaguars. The Jackson Jaguars, bless them, they took the Texans close last week, but they stink. And their defense has got worse with every passing game. Did the only take, danger. Did he take them just close enough, Neil? It's not just close enough that you know you're thinking, oh, we may have something here in Jake Luton and David Pleat would go wild. Um, but the only worry I have here for this is that it's going to be a blowout early, and that they then split between Jones and what's his name, Jamal Williams. Yeah. But I, I think in terms of touchdown upside, I will go with Aaron Jones. I've also gone for Aaron Jones seven thousand one hundred in the same logic. Um, I wonder if they try and pound it a lot. Um, and Aaron Jones gets a lot of play in that sense. Even if they do split carries with Williams, he may get full series and 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 set. So I'm going with I've gone with Jones seven thousand one hundred. Uh, running back two, Neil. Running back two, six thousand six hundred. Same game, different lineup. Everybody needs 
good neighbours, Jim Robinson. I was so close to picking Robinson in this, but then thought it'd be weird that I'd pick Jones against Robinson, considering I I picked Jones in the logic tree that the Jacksonville Jaguars are going to get battered. But they're going to get battered, but they will establish, uh, and they will try and establish. I mean, even last week, uh, Jim Robinson, uh, 99 yards and a touchdown. He's still getting a bulk of the running back targets, although Chris Thompson did eat into them a little bit last week, but he's getting all the carries. Um, so I still like him for his, uh, the volume opportunity floor that he has. So 6,600, let's go. And my running back too is one of those awkward situations when the guy who writes loads about fantasy suggests that you shouldn't pick the guy that you picked. Um, I've gone for Mike Davis, uh, Tampa Bay against Carolina. Um, do you want to hear something weird that I heard about Tampa Bay? Do you know when you know in the in the Tampa uh, the, the the Brady twelve or whatever he calls it regime? Do you know when Tom goes to bed? Um, go about half six at night, like half eight to nine o'clock at night. Do you know three Sounds games? Late. Do you know three games he's stunk this year? Ah, late kickoffs are all games which go beyond nine p.m. Oh, well, he's screwed if they get to the Super Bowl, isn't he? He's, I mean, he's been all right in years past. I'm just, you know, it's just weird. That was all I heard, it and I don't know. Um, I've gone for Mike Davis because he's going to do the Christian McCaffrey role. Is he going to do it as well as Christian McCaffrey? No. But is he going to do it well enough? Yes. So 6,700, I've gone for Mike Davis. Wide receiver one, Neil. Wide receiver one, I've gone for Bobby Trees and um, Sir Robert Woods. Um, as we've said, the Seattle Seahawks are playing Los Angeles Rams. Their pass defense is a work of fiction, along the lines of you know Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny. Um, and it's I wanted to get a if piece of the passing attack. In your car right now with your kids, obviously Neil's joking. Of course, uh, yeah, because they're not works of fiction. Of course, they are established historical characters, and we should respect them uh, throughout time. It's one of those games, I said I wanted a piece of it, and I just think that Robert Woods is the most trustworthy. Not the most exciting, but I don't think the passing game for the Rams is particularly exciting because it is literally just, it's side to side. It's like the NFL equivalent of watching Vinny Samways play. But one for the, one think, for the kids there. One for the teenagers there. Um, amusingly, of course, his nickname was Sideways, ho-ho. Um, yeah, he's 6,600, especially as Cooper Cup appears to be on the injury report every day this week for the same injury but a different report. Fantastic. My wide receiver one is Tyler Boyd, uh, Cincinnati mm. at the Pittsburgh Steelers. Lots of volume, lots of play. Um, they're going to throw a lot. It looks like, again... Joe Mixon is going to be out of this game. He's, Joe Mixon didn't practice today. Today is Thursday. That's, again, there's a chance he won't start, which calls into question my league of records and whether I'll still be top of the division come come Sunday, come Monday night. Um, but Tyler Boyd's done really well this year. As of as of him, Anti Higgins have become really good weapons under Burrow. I think he's got. Like over 15 points in four out the last five weeks, so I expect that to continue. And he's 6,400. The Steelers, as well, if they do have a weakness on defense, I'm not saying they do, is they do give up a lot of production from the slot. That's obviously where Tyler Boyd primarily lines up. Um, let's say this season he's averaging 17.6 fancy points per game. Um, I mean, it, it, he's a short dump off, it's only 10.8 yards per reception, but he's averaging 73 yards per game, so it's good, solid stuff, and you know, if he finds the end zone, for your wide receiver too, your, pretty, your wide receiver, you know, your main wide receiver in this, he's giving you a reception-based floor, so yeah, I like it. Who's your wide receiver too, Neil? Wide receiver two is the greatest wide receiver in the history of the NFL, it's Mr. Travis Fulgham. <laughs> um, the worry would be that Alshon Jeffrey is likely to be available for Sunday. And I really hope the Eagles don't decide, let's force feed them to show what we've been missing. No, no, I think we all know what we've been missing and it's not really been missed. Um, so snaps for Old Sean are going to, I don't want them to take snaps away from Travis Fulgham. So a bit of rationality here, Doug. Let's, you know, let's be rational. Uh, despite what your dickhead ex-teammate says about our quarterbacks that have nothing to do with him. Let's be rational this week. Travis Fulgham, 6,400. The Giants have not been terrible defensively. 
Um, there's a good chance that James Bradbury will go up against Fulgham, but you cannot stop Travis Fulgham. You can only contain him. Um, speaking of speaking of that that um, Mississippi buffoon, um, how's your how's your president getting on? Um, yeah. I hope he started packing his fucking bags. Yeah, I mean it's it's one of those. It's you know you, you probably should have kept the quarterback. Was this the quarterback who got benched for a six round rookie and could barely beat out Mitchell Trubisky? You think we should have kept him? Thanks, Brett. Go and send your wang pitches to someone else. Off your pop. Uh, on that though, uh, not on his wang. On please on, not on, on Nick Foles. Monday night football is the resistible force meeting the movable object. Of the Chicago Bears versus Kirk Cousins in prime time. Oh, we could look how at negative can points. Lo- how can Kurt lose this game? By doing Kurt things. Uh, but believe me. <laughs> it's unbelievable. It's like someone's basically handed him a victory and he's just going to walk past it or trip up. Yeah. Um, my wide, res- wide, wide receiver two is uh, Will Fuller, uh, Houston against the Cleveland Browns. Again, we slagged off the Texans, but we wanted to carry on picking them because we're like that. Um, we laughed a lot at Will Fuller because he's usually injured or all he does is catch long bombs. But this year, he's actually been outrageously consistent from a fantasy standpoint. Um, he's 6,700, so technically my wide receiver won, I guess. Um, mm. I expect him... To, he is basically the wide receiver in Houston now. Um, so yeah, a lot to play from Deshaun. So six thousand seven hundred will pull it. I mean, since Bob uh, did leave, Brandon Cooks has been more involved in the offense and is a bit more consistent than Fuller. But in terms of the big play, Fuller is still delivering that, and he scored a touchdown in every game this season. So we know that Deshaun Watson is very heart and soul wants to go deep, and that's what Fuller gives him. So yeah, hey, wide receiver three nil. Well, I see the three, and this is, you know, it's more of a volume thing rather than, you know, this is not one that I'm terribly excited about. Uh, it's Jacoby Myers, uh, the New England Patriots against the Baltimore Ravens. In the last three weeks, Jacoby Myers has commanded 38% of the Patriots' targets. Uh, he, he went off on Monday night against the Jets. That was a weird, weird game, by the way. It was over so quickly because both teams just wanted to run the ball. Um, it's probably the best I've seen Joe Flacco play since the Ravens Super Bowl. <laughs> um, but yeah, he Myers was just open. He just got open, and Cam Newton got him the ball. It is not pretty watching Cam Newton pass the ball at the moment. It no. looks like a struggle for him, and it's the low trajectory. I'm no quarterback guru, I know, but his low angle of release is probably contributing to the fact that only Kirk Coupons has had more passes battered than Cam Newton. But I think, you know, Jacob Myers, they're going to move him round. The Ravens have excellent corners, all three spots. But I think Cam Newton's got to throw it to someone. And there's no point expecting a touchdown because the Patriots just don't throw them anymore. Um, my wide receiver three is Marquise Brown. Um, same game, Baltimore at New England. Um, shouted a couple of weeks ago. Um, got a few targets last week. I expect that to continue this week. They need to throw it more. They just do. Um, what I do want to bring up is, like, obviously his nickname's Hollywood Brown, um, and I, I listen to the Ringer uh, Fantasy podcast, and they've now christened him Bakersfield Brown as somewhere Ooh. that's not Hollywood. But do you do, do you know which Hollywood he's named after? As uh, the resident Baltimore expert, you do know it's not Hollywood, California. It's actually not. Hollywood, Florida, where he's originally from. Um, but yeah, so uh, Bakersfield Brown is 5,700 and he's my wide receiver three. Um, tight end, Neil. Tight end, you know, save us Hooper, man. You're our only hope. Austin Hooper is back once again like a renegade master. He was averaging 20% of the Browns targets before he had an emergency appendectomy. Um, but obviously he's going to come back now. Um, that means less opportunities for Harrison Bryant, probably David and Joker as well. He has shown that he's got a nice chemistry going with Baker Mayfield. He's 3,900. I think his price is probably only this low because he's been missing games. Because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. uh, I think in terms of his workload, he should be a bit more expensive. But he isn't, so I'm taking advantage of that. Um, my tight end is Dallas Goddard. Um, he played 
pre-buy um, and got one target. Um, I didn't think he was fit, um, but when he has been fit, he has been Carson Wentz's number one target, and I expect that to continue. So why Neil obviously believes that he, the Wentz will throw to the greatest living wide receiver. Um, I think he will go to God. He's four, he's only four thousand two hundred, uh, which is unbelievable considering in terms of target share for for tight ends. He's probably got to be in the top five this week for me, and to get him at such such value is outrageous. So yeah, four thousand two hundred Dallas Goddard. If for some bizarre reason he is still available on waiver wires in your leagues. Anyone who's listening to this, you need to pick him up for the for the back end of the season. Because we've said, um, and it's been a, a steam point in the, not a steam point, sorry. It has been a much mentioned point in the fancy community by people whose opinions we usually respect, um, like the wokest motherfucker on the planet, Mr. Matt Kelly himself. If Dallas Goddard gets the gig, the full-time starting gig all to himself, He's a top a top three tight end yeah, in fantasy indeed. football, um, and Zach Ertz, who didn't look good before he got injured, still don't know when he's going to come back. May not get his job back. I I I had got it in one of my leagues and just kept him on IR and just sucked up the fact that you know I wasn't losing him because I knew he'd be back now, and I, I think he'll get all the volume. So mm. just kept him. Um, who's your flex, Neil? Uh, Duke Johnson, five thousand. In my flex is my um, handcuff with Tua, and that's Devontae Parker, $5,000. Um, no Preston Williams this week, which now is down the targets for Tua, and that means I assume more volume for Devontae. He's 5000 again, playing the Chargers. So he'll probably score a last-minute touchdown from the one-yard line, falling backwards um, unbelievably to win by one point. Yeah. Um. Who is your defence and special teams? Well, you've got an offensive line that is allowing a ton of pressure on the quarterback, and you've got a defensive line that is pressuring quarterbacks at an astonishingly high rate. You really need to put them into your fancy team. So I've gone with the Philadelphia Eagles defence against the New York Giants, because Daniel Jones, and he'll probably do something stupid like beat the Eagles. He won't. But I will he say, can only beat yeah. Washington. Mm. He won't. But I'll say this. Yeah, but I will say this about him. He is shit. And he's oh, getting I worse. No, I know. I know. And, and that's, you why, to him. that's why continually losing to him is maddening. I'm not no problem losing. We've discussed this already. Like I was well, it was good to beat the Cowboys, like stick to a lane and lose. Like, do you know what mm. I mean? You caught yourself a draft pick there. Um but the 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 losing to Daniel Jones all the time is not acceptable. He's five and sixteen, I think, as a starting yeah. as a starting quarterback, and four of those victories were against Washington. I did love as well, though. You know, it's slightly off topic, but describing Terry McLaurin's touchdown as a sixty-eight yard bomb. <laughs> yeah, it was him. Yeah, but when it was a seven-yard slant that he took the other 60, 61 yards. Um, I know we're all happy Alex Smith is back in the NFL, but we don't need to blow smoke up his ass. No, we don't. Um, speaking of Alex Smith, uh, my defence and special teams is the Detroit Lions, 2,600. Um, there's talk of a guy called Sweat starting mm. it being on the roster this week and possibly taking snaps. This is ungood. And I'm glad we got that victory over Dallas. But when we're 2-14... and 14, and only the third pick, and we're not getting the quarterback that we desire, I will regret winning that game. I see where you're going with this, but I I cannot in any way recommend anyone have anything to do with the Detroit Lions, because they are atrocious. They are defensively atrocious. shocking. Did you see... Do you know a how, I think was... The New York football giants are t- atrocious, and, we th- and Alex Smith threw directly to them twice. Not like, oh God... No, no. He basically looked. There was a guy in blue, and he threw it to him. Thing is, though, people again. Greg Cassell, who we all we both know, respect. He said that was actually quite a good disguise, and maybe Alex Smith, having not got starters reps, wasn't fully tuned into it. The Detroit Lions 
against a team that was going to establish and establish hard, at one point had 10 men on defence, and Jamie Collins only noticed this so late that he didn't have time to call timeout. And guess what happened? Minnesota ran right through the gap. I, I, I am anti-Washington, and therefore the Detroit Lions are in my team. They are 2,600. That is the, the loneliest... Dankest, darkest hill to die on, I believe you could probably pick. Yep, yep, yep. Put it this way no one else is picking the lines, so therefore, if something happens, my victory is, assu- is assured. Yeah, to paraphrase from Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels, there's a reason he's 500 to 1. <laughs> <laughs> Let's recap the teams, Neil. Who's your quarterback? Baker Mayfield. I've got two, eh? Look on these young quarterbacks. We're about one. Aaron Jones. Same. Running back two. Aaron for his finest, Mr. Jim Robinson. Uh, mine is uh, Totten's fantasy loser, Mike Davis. Uh, wide receiver one. Bobby Trees. I've got Tyler Boyd. Uh, wide receiver two. The Goat. I've got Will Fuller. Um, wide receiver three. Jacoby Myers. I've got Vegas Real Brown. Tight end. Hooperman. Dallas Goddard. Uh, Flex. The Duke. I've got Devontae Parker and defence and special teams. The Eagles. I've got um, Matt Patricia's um, silver and blue army. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Neil, uh, that's the end of the show, but before we go, where can people catch you this week? Find me on Twitter at end up 13 usual guff that's out. Um, I wrote of his tight end report that I say, was the Hooperman headline. Uh, some stats from last week that are probably now, you might want to read them now, you know, just for idle conversational pieces uh, there at Numberfire, as is my Super Bowl odds tracker. Um, usual stuff out for Ravens Wire this week. I've done my seven fun facts about the matchup between the Ravens and the Patriots. I've done a look at the AFC playoff race and a look at the draft order, and I will have the scouting report for the Patriots out as well. I'm thinking... You know, depending if anyone's listened to this and anyone's interested, I'm thinking of maybe opening myself up to do like a sit start thing on Twitter mm-hmm. on Sunday before the games. Um, I'm still thinking, you know, I'm fairly certain Kate will lock me in the back room so I can get on with it. But it's a question of if anyone's actually interested in my opinion. Well, but find it's either yeah, it's either me who's totally who's going to sit there and stare at Twitter for people to ask him, or you can ask you know Matt Berry and Field Yates with their two million followers. So. Good luck, good luck getting an answer. Um, I am at Mainzy7. Combined, we are at Waxing underscore Lyrical. Enjoy week 10. Don't forget, not many games early. Get your coffees in about half eight, nine o'clock, because you need that buzz about 11 to get yourself through it. Until then, these top guys are out. <laughs>